Hello everyone. Welcome back to our course on mechanical behavior of materials part two. So in the last lecture, uh, we discussed about uh, a Griffith criteria, which is energy based approach. And uh, previous to that, uh, we talked about the English criteria, which is stress based approach. Okay. So now we know what is the stress at the crack tip or say if you have a whole elliptical or circular hole or the shape is given, you should be able to figure out what is the stress at the crack tip. And that is the maximum in a given plate that we have already discussed. Okay. So today what we are going to do, we are going to start talking about the mode of deformation first. Then I will introduce the concept of LEFM. And then we will discuss about the stress distribution uh, ahead of the crack tip. So till now we have discussed about the stress at the crack tip. So what is the stress distribution ahead of the crack tip? We are going to discuss about this. Okay, so let's start. So the first is we will talk about mode of deformation. Okay, so if you have a presence of the track, there are three uh, mode of deformation. Okay, so basically you have mode one, then mode two and the last one is mode three. Okay, so you have three type of mode of deformation. So let me draw the schematic. Okay, something like this. So let me draw again two more very quickly. In the last one. I'm going to show you all the three modes in these three diagrams. That's why I'm drawing. Okay. So something like this where you have, so these are your tracks, right? So these are your tracks in the plate. So mode one is your opening or tensile loading. Opening or tensile mode. Okay. This is your mode two. Say sliding or in plane shear mode. Okay. And the third is your mode 3, which is tearing or anti-plane shear mode. 
okay so mode one is your opening mode that means you're trying to open the track right so if you have a track you're trying to apply a tensile loading and you're opening the track okay so your loading will direction will be something like this you are opening the track so that is mode one okay mode two is sliding or in plane shear mode so you're in plane so this is your plane right and you're sliding in the sliding mode right so this is going to be something like this this direction and this direction okay so you are applying load in plane sliding load okay so this is mode two and the last one is steering mode you are like it's like a paper you are holding a paper and then you are just steering it okay like this so this becomes your mode three so you are applying load in opposite directions you are tearing it so suppose you have a paper and then you make a track in the paper or just tear it right and then you do like this okay so that becomes mode three so in general you have uh, three different uh, modes of deformation opening mode or tensile mode that is mode one mode two is sliding or in plane shear mode and mode three is tearing or anti plane shear mode so depending upon the conditions you can have either of these three or the combination of these three Okay, so that is about mode of deformation and we are going to mostly use in our lecture, this is mode one. Okay, now let's talk about LEFM, which is linear elastic fracture mechanics. So I have already discussed about a little bit about fracture mechanics, right? So this is the linear elastic fracture mechanics. Okay, so we assume that linear elastic material okay. There are some more assumptions. So the first one is plastic deformation is negligible at the crack tip. So I'm trying to tell you in which conditions you can apply linear elastic fracture mechanics. Okay, so the one of the conditions is that plastic deformation is negligible at the track tip. Okay, so suppose you have a track here, right? So whatever deformation, plastic deformation you are getting here, the that region we generally call it plastic zone. I am going to discuss about plastic zone uh, subsequently. Okay. So for now, just remember there is something called plastic zone and that is the reason where you have a plastic deformation. One of the quantification we can do using plastic zone. Okay. So this region is smaller, much, much smaller than A. Right. So that is, that is what I mean by plastic deformation is negligible. So that means we can write plastic zone is much, much smaller than A. Where A now you know is the track length, okay, or say half track length, depending upon the configuration. Second is although you are get, going to get you know locally plastic deformation, overall your material is behaving elastically. So overall, the material is. Elastic. Okay. That means you have a track in elastic bodies. So you're not going to get significant amount of deformation overall. There will be little bit of deformation that you mostly elastic in nature. Okay. And this we call as small scale yielding. The first point. 
so uh, when i say the plastic deformation is negligible attractive this is in some books you will see small scale yielding okay so yielding is taking place in a very small scale so that is one second is the overall material is behaving elastically uh, even if locally you are going to see yielding in the material because of the presence of crack and remember why we see yielding even if the applied stress is elastic uh, less than yield stress because locally you have stress concentration in front of the crack tip okay now if the there is a large plaster deformation if plastic deformation is large then one can use elastic plastic fracture mechanics epfn okay so this epfn we are not going to discuss in this uh, in this uh, course we will mostly focus on the use of lefm in the fracture mechanics okay and there are two assumptions i have mentioned here okay so now uh, if you remember in the english uh, uh, criteria we discussed about the stress at the crack tip which can be given in terms of the crack length and the shape of the crack, isn't it? Now, we are going to uh, talk about, yeah, but remember that at that time, we were not able to figure out what is the stress distribution ahead of the crack tip. That is also very important, right? Because how the crack is going to grow, you know, uh, the path, etc., the extent of crack growth, all will depend upon the stress distribution ahead of the crack tip. Okay. And that was not given by English. Okay. So we are going to discuss about this. How do we calculate the stress distribution ahead of the crack tip? And that was derived first by Westergaard. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you uh, a solution of a stress distribution in front of the uh, crack tip. But I'm not going to derive it completely because it requires the knowledge of uh, calculus, area functions, etc. So I'm going to give you some steps so that we can reach to a final solution and which we can use. You know, as a material scientist, we can use all these uh, solutions to understand what is happening at the practice. Okay, that is what we are going to do. Okay, so uh, the aim is to uh evaluate the stress distribution head of the practice okay and that was first given by Westergaard so we are going to talk about Waste guards solution. Okay, so uh, you have an infinite plate. Okay, and then you have a central crack. Right now. Let me draw two axes here. X and Y. Okay. And this length is 2A. So our aim is to find out what is happening ahead of the practice. So let's take some element here. Okay. So our aim is to find out 
the stress distribution, which is a sigma yy, sigma xs, and then you have here stress tau xs. Okay, so you have a track as shown here. We know the track, uh, uh, sorry, stress at the track tip using English. We are trying to find out what is happening, what is the stress distribution ahead of the track tip, which is this square, right? So the small element, so at that particular position, what is the stress distribution? That means we have to figure out what is sigma xs, sigma yy, and sigma tau xy. That is what we are going to do, okay? Okay, so what uh, Westergaard did no? using complex numbers and airy function or airy stress function. Okay, so Westergaard used the concept of complex numbers and then airy stress function, combined both of them and came up with a very nice solution of the stress distribution in front of the track field. Okay, so what is uh, uh, airy function now? So I'm not going to uh, go into the detail of the derivation. Some of them, uh, you know, you will be given in the assignment. In rest, you can go through the books. There are many books, even in the internet, you should be able to figure out, you know, how the derivation was done. So, area stress function pi is related to 2D space. Components and by the way, the uh, solution of Westerard was given uh, assuming it to be in plane stress condition, that means in two dimensions. Okay, so the area stress function uh, phi we can use that phi and uh, phi figure out what is the stress component, so that is sigma xs that will be given as. this then sigma yy will be given as okay and tau xy will be given as negative of phi. okay so if you know the array function you should be able to figure out what is the stress distribution in front of the tractive where x and y i have already mentioned before in the diagram if you remember so if you have a track here, right? X is in this direction and Y is in this direction. Remember, origin in the Westergaard solution is at the center of the track. Okay, so this is your origin. So S and Y is known. So Westergaard used complex numbers. and airy function to obtain solution of stress distribution ahead of the tractor. Okay. So the airy function which was used by uh, Westergaard was pi equal to real of this and imaginary of this. Okay. That is the ID function where D of 
pills divided by dz. So remember, I am uh, writing down two z. Okay, one z has dash in between, and the bottom one, if you see in the denominator, it doesn't have uh, bar in that. Okay, so they, you need to distinguish between these two z. Okay? In fact, one is capital, and another one you can assume it to a smaller one. So this will be given as this. Then another one, we can differentiate the z bar with respect to a small z. That will be z. And the last one, we can differentiate z, z with respect to small z. And that will be given as this. Okay. And small z is what? That is s plus i y. So if you see, I am now on the right side. So here, small z is plus i y, where s and y you know. Okay. So this is actually a complex uh, function which uh, was used by Westergaard. And then the z, capital Z, with the function of small z that is given as sigma infinite divided by root over 1 minus a by small z squared. Okay, this is important. And what is sigma infinity? That is the far field stress. You remember far field stress, right? They apply the stress away from the crack. Okay. So, sigma infinity is power field stress. And A is your half track length. And a small z is S plus i y. Okay. So, now you know phi you know the relationship between capital Z and small z and z bar, z double bar, etc. And you also know the stress distribution see, on the top, right? So if you can different, double differentiate phi with respect to y, you should be able to calculate what is sigma xs and so on for sigma yy and tau xy. And that is what Westerdard did. Okay? So if you can use Tauchi Rayman equations complete set of equations. For a stress field will be sigma SS. So we know what is sigma SS, double differentiation of any function with respect to y. And if you use Cauchy Raman equation, then you can calculate what is sigma SS, and that will be given as real part of z minus y. Many part of nine. Okay, sigma y y will be given as this. Okay, and then tau x y will be minus of y r e z prime. Okay, and what is z prime? That is d z by d small z right and z we know that is sigma infinity divided by root square 1 minus a by z whole square so if you differentiate that with respect to small z you are going to get z square as minus of sigma infinity and this can be part of your assignment okay divided by small z cube 1 minus a by z whole square 3 by 2. Okay. So now you know what is capital Z. You know what is uh, Z prime. 
and you also know this sigma xa sigma yy and tau xy using cauchy cauchy riemann equations okay so now you know everything you also know what is small z that is x plus iy okay so at y equal to 0 so now we are talking about the track plane so if you have a track So we are in this plane. Okay? So remember x was here and y was here. So this is your x and this is your y. Okay? And this is your right plane. Okay? So at y equal to 0, that means it is in the s plane and we call it as track plane. Okay. So at y equal to 0, z which is given by s plus i y, y is 0, so z becomes s. Okay. So you can write now sigma. So let me write down some numbers here. 1, 2, and 3. Okay. So from 3, sigma y y is given like this okay and what is r e z r e z is sigma infinity divided by 1 minus a square by s square and y term here is 0 so the second term is 0 right so what you get is sigma y y as this but remember, this is for track plane. Where y is equal to 0. Okay. So, in this particular plane, now I am, I am on the diagram left side. So, in this particular plane, you know the stress distribution. Right. You know what is sigma yy. Okay. And if you see sigma sx, that will be equal to sigma y y also. Okay, because y is 0 there. Okay. So, that is what you have uh, the stress distribution at the track tip. Okay? Now, if you remember in the English also, we discussed if uh, at the track tip, if it is very, very sharp, it can go to infinite, right? This also created the same thing. At the track tip, as x is equal to a, right? So at the track tape, x is equal to a. So sigma y y goes to infinite. Okay. So Westergaard gave us a very nice solution of variation of stress at the track plane or say in front of the track, uh, uh, track what we have done we have done uh, made y equal to 0 so that we can nicely find out what is the stress distribution on the track plane. okay now there is a problem here the problem is everything here in terms of x y etc right so you know after say two decades or something like that in Irwin Irwin came into picture and he used the polar coordinate and some approximation and very nicely modified this Westergaard equation and came up with a solution which is an approximation to the exact solution of Wester given by Westergaard. Okay. So we'll talk about the Irwin solutions now. So again, what happened? Westergaard gave an exact solution, but there was a problem that z was given in terms of x and y, right? Erwin came into picture and then uh, he used uh, the polar coordinates and some with some approximation, he came up with an approximate solution of the exact solution of given by Westergaard. And that is what the approximate solution we are going to discuss and you will eventually see that this approximate solution can be very nicely used to figure out what is the stress distribution at the track tape 
you know, we near the thread tip, not far away from the thread tip. Okay, so let's discuss Irwin solutions. So instead of z equal to s plus i y, Irwin use z equal to a plus r e to the power i theta, and it is in polar coordinate. So if I make again same diagram, so remember both are infinite plate. If we track. Now if I had Westerhard equation, so that was S and Y where the origin was at the center. Now in the case of Irwin, it is at the track tip. So we are taking R from the track tip, not from the center of the track. This is important between Erwin and uh, uh, Stuttgart. Okay. So R here, and this is your theta. So if theta becomes zero, all the solution will correspond to what track name. We just discussed about that. Okay. So at x equal to r equal to 0, z becomes a, if you see the equation I have written here, so this one. Okay. So at r equal to 0, z becomes a, and uh, uh, in general here we can always write x equal to r plus a in the track plane. Right. Okay. So at the track tip, R is zero. So S becomes A. Similar to what we saw in Mr. Dart. Now what was the uh, solution for Z? That will be given as A by Z square. Okay, so this I showed you before. Now let's put Z equal to A plus R e to the power I theta. Okay, so this equation will become sigma infinity. Now we will solve it huh? quickly. So 1 minus a by a plus r e to the power i theta whole square. And then it will be sigma infinity a square plus r square you can write like this. So if you solve, we are going to get this. Now, there was an assumption, if you remember, for application of LEFM, R is less than A. Right? So we are going to uh, uh, define this. Uh, oh, sorry, that was plastic on side. So we are assuming now that this whole uh, solution is valid for very, very small R. Okay, it is much smaller than A. So Z, Z will be sigma. So we are not going to neglect, you know, R square terms from top as well as bottom. So it will become root over A square divided by root over 2 R e to the power I theta and K. Okay, after we have taken the approximation of R is much less than A. Okay, so we are talking about the stress distribution very near to the track. That is the assumption here. Okay. So this will be sigma infinity root over a by 2r e t power minus i theta by 2. So that is the solution you have for z. Okay. Now we can use 
e to power i theta as cos theta plus i sin theta. So we can write z of z equal to sigma infinity 2 pi r. Then e to power minus i theta by 2 will be cos theta by 2 minus i sin theta by 2. Okay. So that is the solution you are getting for capital Z. Now similarly you can calculate for Z prime and that will be given as sigma infinity divided by 2R over A by 2R cos of theta by 2 minus I sine 3 theta by 2. Okay, so now you know Z and Z prime. Okay, now let's apply the equation we knew from Westergaard, right? We saw it in the Westergaard solution. So that was sigma SS equal to Re Z minus Y in Z prime. Okay, so if you do that, you are going to get let me change the color. So this will be now sigma SS equal to sigma infinity root over A by 2R cos theta by 2 minus Y sigma infinity by 2R root over A by 2R sine 3 theta by 2. Okay. So we have taken the real part of Z which is this year okay and then we have taken imaginary part of uh, z z prime which is this and then this one. okay so you are going to get a equation like this the last one okay now what is so if you see here everything is in terms of uh, theta r, but now you have y also. So we can convert y in terms of r and theta, right? How? So you know this is r, this is theta, and we also know the x and y is in this direction. Okay. So y we can always write as r sine theta. Correct. So let's put y here as r sine theta. So sigma SS is going to be sigma infinity root over A by 2R okay, cos of theta by 2 minus. Now Y we are replacing by R sine theta by 2R. Sigma infinity is already out. So this will be this. Okay. Now sine theta we can replace it by sin theta by 2 cos theta by 2, right, into 2. So, 2, 2 will cancel out. So, this will be sigma infinity root over A by 2R cos of theta by 2 minus sin theta by 2 cos theta by 2 and then sin 3 theta by 2. R, R will also cancel out. So overall, you are going to get an equation like this. One minus sine theta by two, sine theta by two. This is your sigma s x. Okay. Now let me write it, it another way. So let me write down again. So uh, what you got is sigma s is equal to sigma infinity root over a by 2r cross of theta by 2 1 minus sine of theta by 2 sine of 3 theta by 2. Okay. We can write this as root over, so I am now placing pi in the numerator as well as denominator. So we can write like this. Okay. 
Okay. So this is your sigma xs. So we have derived a solution for sigma xs and we are assuming r is much less than a. So very near to the practice, the sigma xs is going to vary with respect to r, theta and the applied stress. Mm -hmm. Similarly, you can derive the equations for sigma yy and tau sy and this will be given as sigma infinity root over a phi root over 2 pi r cos of theta by 2 1 plus sin theta by 2 sin 3 theta by 2 okay and the last one is tau sy sigma infinity root over 5 in divided by 2 pi r cos theta by 2 sin theta by 2 cos of 3 theta by 3. So you have got the equations for the stresses in front of the practice what we wanted to do. Yes. Okay, so if you remember our diagram before, so we wanted to do calculate the stress in at this point or at this element which was given as sigma yy, sigma xx and then how xy. Okay. So we have got an approximate solutions of these stresses ahead of the practice tip right, by Irving. So you can figure out, right, if you can vary sigma uh, theta and r, you know what is sigma infinity that is the uh, applied stress. You can figure out what is the stress distribution in front of the tractic. Okay. So overall, if you see, this term is common here. Right. In all three. And this is what we denote as K, which is called stress intensity factor, okay? And you know, this K name was given by Irwin uh, for his friend or his colleague, his name was Kais. So this K comes from Kais, okay? And this is stress intensity factor. Do not get confused with the stress concentration factor which was KT, if you remember, that was sigma t divided by sigma. Okay. So KT is your stress concentration factor, which is unitless. It's a number. Whereas K has a unit stress intensity factor. It has a unit of MPA root meter. Okay. MPA is from uh, sigma and then root over A is there. So it's root meter. Okay. So you need to distinguish between the stress intensity factor and stress concentration factor. A stress concentration factor is unitless and a stress intensity factor is a unit of MPA root meter. Now, if you see this equation, these three equations, sigma xa, sigma yy, tau xy, if you can figure out the stress intensity factor value, you, you already know what is the stress distribution in front of the tractor because R you know, Theta, you know, if you want to calculate the stress at a point in front of the tractic, you already know R and theta, right? So the only factor which you need to know to understand the stress distribution is K. And that's why K becomes very, very important in fracture mechanics, okay? So a stress intensity factor is very important. And if you know a stress intensity factor, you already know what is the stress distribution ahead of the tractic. Okay, and later on you will see I'm going to show you how do you calculate stress intensity factor. There are different formula for different configuration. You know, you have single edge nose tension and then double edge nose tension, pumped uh, tension specimens. So all these specimens, all these configurations, you have uh, already you have a formula of a stress intensity factor which you can calculate uh, easily. And based on that, you should be able to calculate what is the stress distribution 
ahead of the fractive. Okay. So what happens uh, at the track tip uh, or sorry, at the track plane? So if you see at the track plane now, now it's, you know this formula, right? In terms of theta, etc. So if I just see sigma SS, so at the track plane, theta is zero, right? So sine theta and sine three theta, these will be zero. Cos theta will be one. Okay, similarly, sigma yy you can calculate and tau xy you can calculate, okay? So see tau xy is what zero because sine theta is zero here. Okay, so at the track plane, you are not going to have shear stresses. Okay, you are going to have only sigma xs and sigma yy that two both are same because sine theta value is zero. Okay, so at the track plane. Theta is equal to zero, right? So if this is your track, remember in the Irwin solution we are talking about in front of the track tip, right? So this is your theta and this is your r. Westerdahl assume origin as zero. You are at the center of the track, right? So theta is zero. So your equation will be sigma y y equal to sigma infinity root over pi a divided by root over 2 pi r. Okay. And in general, we can always write the equation as sigma r theta equal to k divided by root 2 pi r f of theta, right? So if you see this particular equation here, you know this is k, right? Root over 2 pi r is uh, the denominator and then this whole thing is function of theta, okay? And same thing goes for sigma s s, sigma y y and tau s y. So in general, we can write stress in front of the track tip at the uh, with respect to r and theta as k divided by root pi r f of theta where k is your stress intensity factor okay so now you know what is the stress distribution in front of the tip so we started with the westerdahl equation that was the address solution and then we thought about the irwin's approximate solution so in the next class, I'm going to show you the differentiation between the Irwin and Westerdahl solution and where we can use Irwin solutions. Okay, because remember again, Irwin is an approximate solution, but it is very, very useful because everything now is in terms of K. If you can calculate K, you know very nicely what is the stress distribution in front of the track. Okay, so we'll meet in the next class. Thank you. Mm -hmm.